Hi, my name is Ken Lassison. I'm a citizen scientist. Before we go into the microbiome, etc., we should get an understanding of what a citizen scientist is. A citizen scientist is someone who's not earning their living as a scientist. It may be somebody who is reasonably well qualified to be a scientist, but is not. In my case, I have a Master of Science. I was a high school science teacher and a junior college chemistry and physics teacher for a couple of years. So science is something which I was trained in, which I'm familiar with, but I'm not earning my living from that. I earn my living from doing statistical analysis and computer programming, um, artificial intelligence, and machine learning on occasion. So the result is technically I'm a citizen scientist. I'm not earning my money from the science I'm doing, and I'm doing it because I have an interest in it. Personal interest, family interest, and it's a challenging problem. So now let's go over to look at my main area of interest, which is the microbiome. The microbiome basically means skin bacteria, mouth bacteria, gut bacteria, etc. The dominant one of study has usually been gut bacteria, which is usually done by inspecting stools from people or from animals to see which bacteria were present during the transition of food and the relative amounts of them. And that's done by some fancy scientific methods, frequently called 16S. Um, it's a type of amplification of fragments of RNA to identify the species. Um, now, when we look at the microbiome, and actually let's look, step back further and let's look at the issue of illnesses and conditions, especially anything that falls into the autoimmune spectrum. Autoimmune spectrum to me means that anything that doesn't have a specific single bacteria infection cause, it ranges from cancer to autism, to Parkinson's, to chronic fatigue syndrome, to IBS, to SIBO, to FM, etc. What we find from the research of the last 10 years are the following facts. One is every one of these conditions has DNA mutations associated with higher incidence, SNPs, SMPs. Second thing we find is that almost every single one of them also have a distinctive microbiome signature that is certain types of bacteria are overrepresented and others are underrepresented. And this is not just a single infection, this is a whole shift of whole families and interrelationship between families. Third thing we find is that both the DNA and the microbiome are sensitive to the environment. Um, for DNA, it's often called an epigenetic shift, which either turns on or turns off some functioning of your DNA or changes the amount of its function. Same thing applies to the microbiome. For example, I just read a study recently where high amount of iron intake in mice infected with a deadly disease, 100% mortality, resulted in 100% survival and the reason was that the microbiome in those mice mutated and the mutation because of the presence of iron resulted in them surviving the conditions. In other words, high intake of iron resulted in an epigenetic change in their microbiome. The last item which comes into this equation which affects chronic fatigue syndrome particularly is that often the whole process of a cascade into an autoimmune condition can be the result of an infection. Chronic fatigue syndrome was often referred to as EBV because something like 50 or 50% 50 of some studies had an EBV infections immediately prior and so showed positive antibodies. Other conditions being traced, being suggested, traced back have a high percentage in one subgroup or a different subgroup, Q fever, for example, in Australia. But there's no universal, just bacteria or just infection or just virus cause chronic fatigue syndrome that applies across everybody. What we do find is that there are patterns of bacteria shifts done 
with the conditions and those conditions have been found to be 80 or 90 percent accurate in determining if a person has the um, diagnosis or doesn't have the diagnosis in examples. So we have a complicated situation. We have many factors which can change it and one factor which we can modify easily or at least relatively easily um, is that of diet modifying the microbiome in more extreme cases the use of antibiotics could be suggested but usually nowadays antibiotics use is being curtailed more and more and more and it would be difficult to usually get it prescribed for a microbiome dysfunction. Okay, now let's proceed to the next step.